Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We are now continuing with the chapter on coordination and response and this is O-Level Biology 5090 chapter 11. Uh, this is the second video which is going to be about the eye and the hormones which was the two components which were uh, left from the last video. Now this is a beautiful diagram showing you the front view of the eye and the transverse section of the eye. And uh, we need to be really learning this. It's quite difficult as I can uh, tell you. The first thing which you want to see is number one is the lens. Now the lens divides the eye into the front part and the back part. And the anterior chamber is filled with a fluid which is called the aqueous humor. Okay, just please concentrate on what I'm telling you. Lens. Lens divides the eye into a front portion and a back portion. The anterior portion, which is called the anterior chamber, is filled with a fluid, which is called the aqueous humor. And the back area is filled with a fluid, which is called the vitreous humor. And this is a jelly-like because it's going to maintain the shape of the eyeball. And then, as you can see, something uh, very easy, optic nerve, optic, you know, you hear these shops, which are called optica and optic... Uh, where you get your glasses so optic nerve and inside this is a retinal blood vessel as well very interesting because where this blood vessel comes out that area is called the blind spot which means that at this place there are no uh, light sensitive cells and the two types of light sensitive cells that we have are called rods and cones so we have no rods and cones and so that area if an image forms on that area that's called the blind spot now the place where you have acute vision is called the fovea and that's a central depression here which is going to be the, where the image is going to be formed and where you see very sharply like when I'm reading this the image of fovea is falling onto the, uh, the the image of the word fovea is falling onto the fovea in my eye that's an interesting thing okay then we come on to the different layers now the outermost layer is called the cornea which in front is called the cornea so it's just this part which is called the cornea and then this the behind part is called the sclera so in the front is called the cornea and then at the back which i'm drawing this part is called the sclera which i'm drawing with a squiggly line right and then there's a layer and inside it which is made up of blood vessels and then I'm using another colored marker to show this so that's called the choroid and you can see there are lots and lots of blood vessels in it so the choroid is a second layer which is internal to the sclera layer and then there is the third layer which is called the retina the retina is of course as you can see is uh, the not wholly it's only the back two-thirds so it's up only up to here that you have it it's only up to here that you have it it's not right in front it doesn't go in the front now uh, the important part which uh, i need to emphasize on is that the choroid continues in front the choroid as you can see is this layer and the choroid continues in front here as the ciliary body and then there is the the projection of it which is goes into right in front of it now this part of the eye is called the iris as you can see here this is the iris and then we have the uh, suspensory ligaments so these thread like structures which are holding it so suspensory ligaments here suspensory ligaments and then the lens the lens is the part which is suspended and the lens is the part of the eye which does not contain any blood vessels and then as you can see the iris has been labeled this part which is the front of the eye which is this part again here which is it's actually a little difficult to really visualize it and i'll just show it to you in another diagram so this uh, this part is the iris then the ciliary body which contains the ciliary muscle and then you can see these words suspensory ligaments so the outermost part sclera then the choroid and then the retina so the three layers 
lens dividing the eye into two chambers in the front is called uh, the anterior chamber which contains the fluid which is called the aqueous humor at the back is a gel like which contains the shape which is called the vitreous humor and the lens dividing the eye into a front a smaller portion and the and the and the back which is a bigger portion and then as you can see here the front of the eye has been labeled as a sclera here you can see this then this part of the eye has been labeled as the iris which is the colored part of the eye this is the some people are brown some people are green so this part and then this inner area which is the dark spot is called the pupil Now another diagram showing you the different parts of the eye and where I want you to emphasize is number one the sclera. Uh, the ones which are important for your role levels is of course it's a very complicated drawing but please don't get very confused. You just have to know the very basic sclera, choroid and the retina. Then the fovea, uh, the optic nerve, the artery and the vein which is the retinal artery and the vein then the ciliary body then the suspensory ligaments the lens the iris the cornea and the pupil that's all what i want you to remember and i don't want you to get very confused and get upset if you're not finding it a little difficult to understand now the first uh, reflex that we have to study in it is called the pupil reflex so this is a diagram of the pupil reflex and as you can see what is happening is that the pupil size is changing. This is the pupil. This is the pupil. Pupil is a dark circle which you see because you see you're looking into the eye and there's no, it's just a dark like you look open a door and the room is all in dark so you just see darkness. So the pupil, now what you have to understand is the pupil becomes either smaller or larger in diameter. Now, what is surrounding it is the muscles in the iris. So the muscles in the iris of two types. Now, when you want, if somebody shines a bright light in your eye, shines a torch in your eye, so bright light, what is going to happen? Eye in bright light, it's small pupil. So pupil constricts. The word is constricts, not contracts. Contracts is only for muscle. And the circular muscles contract. It's like a rubber band becomes a smaller circle. Circular muscles contract where the radial muscles relax. But if you're entering a place which is in darkness, now we want more light to enter the eye so that you can see better and you don't injure yourself. You don't fall down or something. You don't see the ditch. So the pupil reflex and the pupil reflex, if there is dim light, what is happening? The pupil, we say, dilates. Either you use these words or you use the word enlarges, so pupil becomes a larger diameter. And what has happened is that the circular muscles in this situation have relaxed. The rubber band has relaxed and the radial muscles have contracted. So the pupil reflex is a way by which the eye responds. Now this doesn't happen, you don't have to think about it, it just happens automatically, like somebody shines a torch in your eye. So the retina detects this bright light. Impulses go to the brain. Brain sends impulses to the muscles of the iris. Brain sends impulses to the muscles of the iris. So action of the iris. This is what is being classified here. So the circular muscles contract of the iris and the radial muscles of the iris relax. While if there is less light, then the other way around is going to happen. Less light, of course, the retina detects this, that there's less light. This room is in darkness. And you say, you come on and switch on the lights and say, oh my God, this room's all dark. So the retina detects this dim light and then the impulses go, the information goes to the brain. The brain sends impulses through the motor neurons to the muscles of the iris and the circular muscles relax and the radial muscles contract. So this makes the pupil larger, so more light is going to enter the eye. Just like if you say, oh my God, this room's in darkness, so you pull the curtains aside and you let the daylight come in. So this is a very simple phenomena in which the eye responds to either bright light or dim light.
Now we come to the process of accommodation. Now accommodation is when we're talking about if your eye is looking at something far away, like you're driving in the car and you see a mountain miles away and you see a tree growing at the top of the mountain, well, that's a very, very distant object. Now, how are you able to see that and how are you able to read this on your laptop? So something near objects and distant objects. So on a drive, looking at something miles away and reading a book, you're looking at something very near. I'm working on my iPad, so I'm looking at something very near. Now, two things have to happen. When the distant object, you have to understand is there parallel light rays coming from that distance. While in a near, nearby object, you see their divergent rays. So parallel light rays in a distant object and here we have divergent light rays coming from a near object. Now, in order to focus something which is parallel, you need a less convex lens. You need less divergence. But when you're looking at a near object, you see divergence, so you need more convergence. So you need a more convex lens. More convergence, more convex lens. So to focus on objects in the distance, the surgery muscles relax and the lens flattens, becomes thin. Light rays are slightly refracted by the lens. But when you're looking at a near object, Nearby, the ciliary muscles contract and the lens becomes more rounded, more convex, so that the lens reaches its minimum, maximum curvature, so that it can be refracted and you can see the upside down image on the fovea. Now, further explaining this, when you're looking at something um, focusing for, now this is actually focusing for near vision. Now, as we look at this, uh, another uh, diagram, which is a way, I think, a better diagram than the previous one. When you're looking at something near, you have these uh, rays from a near object coming and you see this is the point that you're looking at and if they're divergent rays. Now, the lens becomes more convex. Now, very easy to remember, near, more convex. Norway, more cold. Or you can say, Noman, more crazy. Well, you can remember it any way you like. So in a near object, what has to happen? The circular muscles of the ciliary body, you see the ciliary body contracts. You see this becomes a smaller circle. The suspensory ligaments release the pull, so they slacken. Suspensory ligaments slacken. This is the word that we use, nothing else. And the lens becomes thicker or more convex. So the image is focused sharply on the retina. So near more convex. So the circular muscle, ciliary muscles contract. The senses, suspensory ligaments slacken. So you will have to remember this very clearly is that for a near object, we need more convex lens. Because we need to refract more, more refraction so that we can then, the image can be formed and will be focused on the retina. Again, a quick recap of the near vision and how the focusing is going to be because of the divergent rays. So just pause the video here and have a look at this and then you can make your notes and then proceed onwards. Now another simple diagram to understand the near vision and distant uh, vision story. So lens thick, lens thin, suspensory ligament slack, tense, or ciliary muscles relax and ciliary muscle contracted. So if you have to learn it, uh, this would be an easy diagram to remember and then you could easily learn these. Uh, another diagram which is explaining this in a very profoundly better manner, ciliary muscles contract, pulling the border of the choroid towards the lens, suspensory ligaments relax. So another diagram, if you could just pause the video here and have a look at it. Uh, maybe this could be better in understanding it in a better manner. The human eye is another diagram showing you the different parts again. The structures of the human eye are all concerned with focusing an image of what we see onto light sensitive receptor cells in the retina. The receptor cells in the eye convert the light into the electrical energy of a nerve impulse. 
so light energy into an electrical impulse then the receptor cells in the retina that perceive color are called c for color c for cones a different type of receptor cell is responsible for vision at low light intensities and those are called the rods and the rods are 1000 times more sensitive to light than the cones and these are mostly for the dark vision they work more in black and white as well more at night now this is a very good diagram showing you the different parts of the eye and what their functions are. So the iris is the colored ring of muscle that controls the size of the pupil. Then the jelly lens is to find focus rays on the retina by accommodation. Retina is a layer of light sensitive cells, change light energy into electrical impulse. The optic nerve carries electrical impulses to the brain where the image information is processed. Then cornea is a thick layer of transparent cells. Please remember no blood vessels in the cornea, no blood vessels in the lens, and no blood vessels in the conjunctiva. So cornea, thick layer of transparent cells that protect the eye and are the principal means of focusing the rays by refraction on entering the eye. You see up to here it was air and as soon as the rays will hit it, there's going to be refraction. Why there's going to be refraction? Because there's fluid here. So immediately as the light rays hit the cornea, they're going to be refracted because that is going to be the medium changes from air to a fluid, which is called the aqueous humor. Then the pupil is the hole in the iris that lets the light in like the aperture of a camera automatically responds to light levels. And then the ring of muscle controls the shape of the lens, which is the ciliary muscle, controls the accommodation of the eye and the lens the curvature of the lens changes it either becomes more convex or less convex now we come to the part of the chapter which is about hormones so it says define a hormone now when you look at the definition of a hormone it's very basic and very simple a hormone number one is a chemical substance so Please remember all hormones are not proteins, some are proteins, some are got a steroid, so you've got hormones like insulin which is protein and then you've got a hormone like estrogen which is made out of cholesterol, steroidal, it has a fat component to it. So chemical substance, the first part, then the second part is produced by a gland. Produced by a gland and these glands are called endocrine glands endocrine glands then carried by the blood they carried by blood so they go in the bloodstream they will be carried in the bloodstream from one part of the body to the other and is going to alter the activity alters activity of one or more Specific target organs, specific target organs, and last destroyed by the liver. So, the hormone first thing we learn is I always change these colors to make you all comprehend it in a better manner. So number one, I said it's a chemical substance. So I didn't say they were all proteins. I said some were proteins, some were steroidal. The second is that they're produced by endocrine glands. And the third is that they're going to be transported in the blood. And the fourth is that they alters the activity of one or more specific target organs. And then of course they're destroyed by the liver. Because uh, you see all hormones have different time periods that they need to work. Some are short acting, some are long, uh, long term acting. So, but they will be finally destroyed by the liver. Because they can't keep on acting, they have to be removed from the system. Especially hormones like insulin, which have to target the blood glucose level, must be removed. Otherwise your blood glucose level is going to fall. So hormones, this is the basic definition that I talk about. In the beginning. Now let's discuss the role of insulin. Now this is this part of the syllabus which I'm talking about. 
state the role of the hormone insulin in controlling blood glucose concentration. Now, for example, you've eaten a meal very rich in carbohydrates. You've had chicken biryani, biryani is rice, rice is very rich in carbohydrates. You've had roti, you've had fries, all rich in carbohydrates. All these carbohydrates are going to be digested and absorbed. Where do they go to be absorbed? They're going to be absorbed into the blood. So the blood glucose level increases or is rises. <clears throat> now this will be detected in the pancreas. Now in the pancreas you have cells which have a special name and these are called the islet cells of the Langerhans. The islets of Langerhans. Now this, these cells will detect that the blood glucose now has increased. Now these islet cells release a hormone called insulin. This insulin will be thrown into the blood in the pancreas and you know every organ has an artery and a vein. So it will enter the capillaries and then it will enter the veins and it will be carried away. And it will circulate all around the body. But when it reaches the liver, in the liver what it has is a receptor. Receptor means just like an active site where this insulin comes and fits. So how does insulin know where does it have to work because it, it knows very simply there are receptors only in the liver cells where this is going to fit and I usually show you my the marker of my the cap of the marker which I'm holding and writing on the board and I say well if this is the receptor well this marker is going to fit into it. So if I have a black marker and a black uh, cap so the, the black marker is going to fit into the cap. So insulin is carried in the blood and when it reaches the liver it attaches to the receptor and here what it does in the liver cell is it converts the glucose. Glucose is a small soluble molecule. Glycogen is a large insoluble molecule. So the glucose is converted to glycogen and this glycogen is stored in the liver. Now this glycogen is your reserve because if you've had a breakfast and you haven't had anything for the next 10 or 11 hours or even more, this glycogen is going to be converted back to glucose and is going to enter the bloodstream. So you don't need to eat very frequently. You don't need to eat every two hours or every half an hour or every hour because whatever you ate, whatever you might have had, half a plate of biryani, all that carbohydrate is going to be digested and it's all going to be absorbed. So all the food that you eat, you have to remember that, all of that is going to be absorbed into the blood. So if you had half a plate or a three quarter of a plate or a full plate, but well, all of that is going to be absorbed and is going to be converted into glycogen. But then the liver has a, can't store a lot of glycogen. So if you've eaten a lot of rice, well then it's going to be converted to fat. So first the glucose is going to be used by your body cells and is going to be respired by your body cells. But if it's in excess, then it's going to be converted to glycogen and stored in the liver. But still, if there's more of the glucose, then it's going to be converted to fat. So this is the role of the hormone insulin in controlling blood glucose concentration. Then we talk of the hormone adrenaline and this is of course called the stress hormone or the anxiety hormone or produced in stressful situations like, uh, God forbid, you have an accident or uh, there's an earthquake and you need to run. We just had an earthquake a few days ago. Um, or some sort of a stressful situation in which you are uh, in a sort of an uncanny situation and it is something new and you are not used to that situation. So it's also called the fight, fright and the flight hormone. And this is of course produced by the adrenal gland which is on top of the kidneys. You see these are the kidneys, on top of the kidneys you have these adrenal glands and there must be an adrenal artery, an adrenal vein and this hormone is released and thrown into the blood and it is carried all around the body. And it is going to result in increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, pupil size increases but the main thing that it works on is the liver because you've got your glycogen reserves in the liver. And the glycogen reserves are going to be converted to glucose because you might in this stressful situation might need to do a lot of muscular activity. And you might need to uh, maybe have a fight or a brawl or something like that. And so you need to really have more glucose in your system so that your muscle cells can respire and release energy. 
So all this is in anticipation of that muscular activity which you might end up doing. So glycogen reserves converted to glucose and your blood glucose level is going to rise. Now if you look at the last point of the syllabus it says describe the signs and treatment of diabetes mellitus. Now diabetes mellitus is the common word that we use if somebody has got sugar. Now it's actually nobody's got sugar or anything. You have sugar all the time in your blood, but it's increased levels of glucose in your blood. Now when that happens, the kidney cannot remove it. So the kidneys, I have to filter all this out, but they can't reabsorb all the glucose which has been filtered out because in a normal person's glucose, the maximum it goes up to is 200. But in a diabetic, it's going to go up to 400. So when this is filtered, then the kidneys cannot reabsorb it. So what you're going to have is you're going to get glucose in the urine. So you need to do the urine test and test it for glucose and you do the Benedict's test. So you do the Benedict's test on urine and find out whether the person has diabetes or not. Then the other sign, you see we're talking of signs, the other sign which the person would have is that you would test his blood glucose level and that would be high. Because a normal person as I told you is 80 to 120, maximum it goes up to is 200. But this person, when we have his blood glucose tested, it's going to be more than 200, maybe 400, maybe 300, maybe even more than that. Now, what is the treatment for diabetes? The treatment for diabetes is very limited. We can't do anything to jumpstart the pancreas. We failed as uh, biologists, as medical people. We don't really know how to do anything about that. So what we figured out was that let's get people dependent on medicines. So the pharmaceutical industry comes in and they come up with insulin. So people have to inject themselves with insulin. Why? Because insulin is a protein. If you gave it to them as a tablet form, it would be digested by the pepsin in the stomach. So people have to inject themselves with insulin and this enters the blood and is going to correct the blood glucose level. So you can't be given tablets of insulin because insulin has to work. You remember if I told you that the liver cells have receptors on their surface. So the insulin molecule has to go and fit on that. So you can't break it up into, it must maintain its shape. And that is only possible if insulin is given as a form of injection. So injections of insulin, plus they'll have to monitor their diet. They'll have to go on less carbohydrates, which means less starch, which means less roti, less rice, less uh, potatoes. And of course, they have to limit the intake of sweet things, which is of course sugar, sugar. They can't be having chocolate fudge cakes and saying, well, they're going to manage their diabetes. Well, it's going to become uh, troublesome because uh, the medications are not very successful in diabetes. So uh, this is all that I want you to know about uh, the signs and the treatment of uh, diabetes mellitus. And this completes this chapter on coordination and response. Uh, please go through the syllabus once again. Please revise it from the book. Uh, go through the questions, the MCQs and the paper too. And I wish you all the best. Thank you.